Charles Robert Cruz Cruz was a low-level operative involved in the drug trade. Murdered by the mob. On December 4, 1997, a few days after his cousin, Harry Aleman, was sentenced for murder, Robert Charles Cruz disappeared from his home where he was last seen hanging Christmas lights from the gutters on the roof of the house. Although his credit cards and bank accounts never were touched, police suspected that Cruz had purposely vanished for his own reasons. Cruz had spent 14 years on death row in Arizona before his conviction for hiring three men to kill a Phoenix businessman named Patrick Redmond and his mother-in-law on New Year's Eve in 1980. Cruz wanted to take over Redmond's print shop, Graphic Dimensions. Prosecutors said Cruz wanted to use the firm to launder money from connections in Las Vegas. Redmond's 70-year-old mother-in-law was visiting and died after her throat was cut. Cruz was tried four times. He was acquitted in 1995 after the jury decided the state's primary witness, a participant in the killings, was unreliable. Ten years later, in 2007, what was left of Cruz's body was found wrapped in tarpaulin and carpet, buried eight feet underground in a suburban mob burial ground. In 1988, the police found two other bodies on the site, Robert Anthony Hattridge, an associate of outfit killer turned informant Gerald Scarpelli and Mark Oliver, a minor organized crime figure. The site was 50 yards from Jerry Scalise's home. At the time, Scalise was in prison in England, and although FBI agents were sent to interview him about the murders, nothing conclusive was gained. Although Cruz's body had been buried for a decade, police were still able to get a clear fingerprint identification from the corpse. Cruz also had identifiable tattoos on both his arms. It appeared Cruz had been shot to death, two bullets to the temple, rolled up in carpeting and buried. The case remains unsolved. In March 1961, Jerry Scalise was indicted on a larceny charge involving four stolen automobiles. Two years later in January of 1963, Scalise and Harry Aleman were arrested and charged with assaulting a Chicago police captain's son. By March 1967, Scalise had a record of arrests for possession of burglar tools, including lockpicking devices. In 1970, Scalise was sentenced to eight years in prison on federal auto theft charges. Scalise worked under Albert Taco and was accused of being part of the so-called Wild Bunch who were suspected of a number of gangland killings. Jerry Scalise and Arthur Rachel probably stole the 45-carat Marlboro Diamond in London on September 11, 1980, during a $3.6 million robbery in broad daylight at Graff's Jewelry Store in London in a heist that lasted almost exactly one minute. Scalise was quickly identified by his badly deformed left hand, but Scalise and Rachel made little effort to hide their identities, with Rachel renting the getaway car in his own name. They were both arrested after they landed at O'Hare International Airport. They were eventually sent back to England, and in August 1984, Scalise was sentenced to 16 years in an English prison for the crime. In May 1989, a mob informant told the FBI Scalise had mailed the Marlboro Diamond to his sister in New York City immediately after the heist. Backing that up, a London cab driver, Paul Brick, told authorities that Scalise had asked him to mail a package to New York. Nothing concrete has come from those leads. The Marlboro Diamond has never been recovered. Scalise was released from prison in late 1992 after serving more than 12 years behind bars. He returned to Chicago and within two years, January 1994, he was arrested and charged with possession of burglary tools. Five years after that, in July 1998, Scalise was indicted in a cocaine conspiracy. In 1999, he pled guilty to the drug-related charges and agreed with prosecutors to a nine-year prison term. In 2007, federal investigators said that they believe Scalise killed mob enforcer William Dauber and his wife, Charlotte, in Will County, Illinois. In an underworld filled with frightening people, Billy Dauber was considered the coldest killer of them all. He could smile at a person one moment and murder them the next, with no remorse. Gangsters avoided him and the cops feared his mental instability. A southerner by way of Appalachia, Dauber made his way into the outfit under the tutelage of James Jimmy the Bomber Cachuara, a vice czar on the south side of Chicago when Cachuara was locked in a war with Stephen Ostrowski for control of Chicago's lucrative chop shop operations. In 1969, he was credited with murdering at least 20 men, maybe more. Cachuara ended the war by bringing in Albert Taco who murdered Ostrowski. During the war, Dauber proved his worth to Cachuara and soon became his right-hand man. But in 1973, Dauber was convicted of mail fraud and the interstate transportation of a stolen car used in an unsolved murder and sent to prison. 
released in 1976, instead of joining back up with Jimmy Cachuara, Daubers signed up as an enforcer with Albert Taco who was pushing Cachuara out of business. On July 28, 1978, Jimmy the Bomber Cachuara was gunned down as he walked to his fire engine red Cadillac at Hubbard and Ogden Avenue in Chicago. It was one of 14 unsolved murders linked to the outfit's takeover of the car chop business. Dauber, a hothead with a quick draw, started to concentrate on muscling his way into gambling and nightclub operations in the south end of Cook County, while at the same time, corning the market on chop shops in the outer portions of the county in a partnership with Albert Taco, who was then the South Suburban Rackets boss. Albert Caesar Taco, who died in prison in 2005, was a ruthless gangster who demanded, and almost always got, a cut from every vice operator south of 95th Street. From his headquarters in suburban Chicago Heights, he ruled over gambling, prostitution, and chop shops from Calumet City South to Kankakee, from Joliet over the Indiana border to Valparaiso. Billy Dauber was also busy building his own criminal empire inside Taco's territory. He declared war on every junkyard in the area that were moonlighting as chop shops, and there were dozens of them. Charlotte Dauber, Billy's wife, was attractive and street smart, but she complained endlessly and loudly about her husband's bosses, Butch Petroselli and Jerry Scalise, that they didn't appreciate her husband's skills and abilities and how they needed to be replaced. Adding to the tension of Charlotte's public complaining and Billy's insatiable quest for power was the fact that several indictments had torn into the crew and virtually everyone in the mob had come to believe that the Daubers were government informants. Worse, Dauber was running his own rackets and no longer bothering to pay his street taxes on the money he made. It turned out the mobster's suspicions were right. Dauber was in fact cooperating with the government since 1979 when he was arrested on the cocaine and gun charges. There was a discussion between the hit team that would kill the Daubers recalled FBI agent Jack O'Rourke that the mob bosses had ordered that they be hit as soon as possible. They suspected Dauber was cooperating with alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, which he was, actually. They said they had to get them right now. Jerry Scarpelli and Butch Petroselli assigned James Duke Basile to trail the Daubers and take of the preparations the hit team would need to strike. Basile was later implicated in a bizarre armed robbery at the Balmoral Racetrack in suburban Crete, Illinois. But watch and follow was all he did with the Daubers Dukey said Scarpelli doesn't have the balls to kill anybody, although the murder was planned down to the last detail, no one knew when or where it would take place until Jerry Scalise was visiting Daubers lawyer and noticed on the secretary's agenda book that the Daubers were set to appear in Will County Court on July 2nd, 1980. On July 2nd, 1980, the Daubers and their lawyer appeared in court in Will County, Illinois to face charges of concealing cocaine and weapons in their home. They asked for, and got, a continuance. After leaving the courthouse, the Daubers and their lawyer, Eddie Jensen, stopped in a coffee shop. Outside, the mobsters waited in a Ford van. Inside were probably Jerry Scarpelli, Butch Petroselli, and Scalise. The hit team considered crashing into the coffee shop and killing them there, but thought better of it, because, FBI agent Jack O'Rourke recalled, somebody pointed out there were a lot of bridges in Joliet, and the police might block the bridges. Before leaving the coffee shop, the Daubers invited Jensen to come back with them to their house for dinner, but he declined. Eddie Jensen told us later that on a couple of occasions he had gone to their house and the last time, it scared the hell out of him because when he left Daubers' house, he was followed for several miles by a van. Retired FBI agent Jack O'Rourke said Jensen thought it was the mob, and instead it was a press truck. He said he decided he didn't want to be anywhere near Daubers' house. So he said, no, thank you very much, and the Dauber got into their car and drove towards home. As the Daubers drove down the Manhattan Money Road away from downtown Joliet, a car, allegedly driven by gangster Frankie Calabrese, pulled out in front of them and slowed down, forcing Dauber to slow down. Then the Ford van, driven by Scalise, pulled alongside Dauber. The side door slide open and Butch Petroselli lowered a .30 caliber semi-automatic carbines and fired into the car. Jerry Scarpelli blasted the car with a 12-gauge shotgun. Billy Dauber, attempting to avoid the bullets, swerved but lost control of the car and crashed into an apple tree. The van stopped, backed up, and the men got out, aimed and fired their weapons into the Dauber's car. The couple's bodies were found sprawled across the front seat of their Oldsmobile, with three of its windows blown out and its front end crushed against a tree. The hit men drove the van several hundred yards down the road and hid it in a clump of bushes. Petroselli doused the van with lighter fluid and set it on fire to destroy fingerprints or any other evidence left behind. 
In the meantime, the others dismantled the weapons used in the hit and threw them in the Cal Sag Canal from a bridge on Illinois Route 83. Before Gerald Scarpelli died in federal custody by suicide or murder, whichever it was, he told FBI agents that he, Butch Petroselli, and Scalise helped kill the Daubers and that Albert Taco helped in the planning. In April 2010, Scalise was indicted along with Arthur Rachel and Robert Puglia on racketeering charges related to a plan of widespread robberies and burglaries. Faced with a pile of secretly recorded conversation where he discussed the heists, in January 2012, Scalise pleaded guilty to racketeering and was sentenced to 106 months in federal prison. As of 2023, he is free from jail.